Uh, hey everyone, uh, this is Hamad Zamani and I'm the moderator of this talk. Uh, and today I'm really happy that we have Susan Dumay with us. Uh, I don't think that she needs a, a introduction, but it's always really nice to recreate her great achievements. So <laughs> she is a technical fellow and a director of MSR Labs in New England New York City and Montreal. And she's also an adjunct professor at the University of Washington. And I personally had the opportunity to be mentored by her during my time at Microsoft, which was great. Um, prior to Microsoft, she was a member of the technical staff at Bell Labs and Bellcore. And um, her research is at the intersection of HCI, information retrieval, web, and data science. And a common theme of her work is about like bringing user and system together, like having a user-centered perspective to the information systems. Um, she is a co-inventor of latent semantic analysis, um, which is a well-known word embedding techniques developed in uh, 1980 or 1990s. Uh, and it um, has a lot of impact on uh, information retrieval and even deep learning literature. Her research spans a wide range of topics and information systems, spam filtering, user modeling and personalization, context of our information systems, temporal dynamics of information and large scale behavioral interactions. She's a recipient of several lifetime achievement awards. She's an ACM fellow, uh, was elected to the ACM Sikai Academy, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She received the ACM Athena Lecture Award for Fundamental Contribution to Computer Science, the Sigayar Gerald Salton Award for Lifetime Achievement in Information Retrieval, and the Tony Kent Districts Award for Outstanding Contributions to Information Science. Oh, well, the list goes on. <laughs> and the ACM High <laughs> Research Award for Lifetime Achievement in HCI and a Lifetime Achievement Award from Indiana University Department of Psychology, Call and Brain Science. Okay, um, thanks, Sue, for accepting our invitation. And without further ado, I'd like to invite like you to talk about, about the potential personalization in web search for us. Thanks, Hamid, for the uh, for, for the the very generous introduction, and and also for the amazing time we had together um, while you were at, at Microsoft before you joined the the faculty at, at UMass. Um, so thanks everyone for this opportunity. What I want to talk about today is about personalization in the context of of web search. I want to highlight both what I think are tremendous opportunities to improve people's search experiences with personalization and also some of the uh, many challenges that we need to, to consider deeply. Uh, I'm gonna start with a high level perspective on, on personalization. I'll give an overview of the importance of context in search. And then I'll describe a framework that we call the potential for personalization, which helps us um, characterize and quantify the extent to which the same query um, has different intents across different individuals. That is different people might wanna see uh, different results to be um, to, to the same query. I'll give examples that I've worked on that span a really rich part of a, a design space uh, in, in terms of things like where the, the models live, how rich they are, how the people, a representation of a, a person in their, their context and history is incorporated into the search system. And I'll um, end up by talking about a variety of challenges and, and new directions. I, I guess folks can ask uh, questions in, in the chat. Hamid will uh, cue them and interrupt where, where needed. I will also take a few breaks in the, the talk to explicitly ask for uh, questions at the end of each of these sections. But before I, I start uh, talking about the details of personalization, I, I wanna take a look back at you know, 20 or 25 years ago in, in the web and in web search to really help you appreciate, especially if there are undergraduates in the room who grew up you know, literally having information at their fingertips 25 by seven, just how much uh, things have changed in the last 20 years and to really appreciate how people's expectations uh, during that time have changed. And more importantly, with respect to this talk, 
how personalization and contextualization are increasingly part of that. So in 20, about, about 25 years ago, both graphical browsers and, the, and web search engines were very young. That's I think uh, uh, NCSA Mosaic on the left and a couple of the very early, um, what we would think of as modern web search engines, uh, InfoSeq and, and Lycos looked. This is a picture of the online presence. So this is CIIR's homepage from 1997. Um, it, it, it's distinct from what you'd see today, that you have to love the New Times Roman font. And in the bottom, it talks about how it is best viewed with Netscape. I mean, now you don't see any discussions of you know, browsers. I love all the searching there. Somebody offline can tell me who the two people in the, the picture are. I didn't have time to, to, uh, um, to investigate that last night. I don't want to just you know, pick on CIIR. Here's Microsoft Research's homepage from, from that uh, that same era. It has you know, in people whose heads are exploding, computers who are imploding, and, and so on. It was a you know, very, very different world than what you see at these two sites if you look today. More importantly, the size of the web was much smaller. There were only um, less than 3,000 top-level domains, so things like uh, umass.edu or microsoft.com, and today there are literally millions of them. Um, the size of the Lyco search engine when it debuted about 20 years ago was 54,000 web pages. And it wasn't even the full text of the web pages that was indexed. I think the intellectual property um, perspectives were unclear at that time. So uh, they indexed only the first 128 bytes of, of each web page. Uh, and oh, there's an interesting link here that uh, on Lycos's homepage. It's, if you click that link, you see the top 5% of the sites in the web, which is just an, a mind boggling uh, thing today. You would never um, consider browsing uh, large, the number of sites that fall into the, the top 5%. But then, you know, it was a few thousand pages. They had a reasonable presentation of it. You could see new things that had happened. And what's most interesting um, given uh, my perspective in, in looking at, at user-centered design is really understanding what people are, are doing. And at that time, uh, Lycos had about a thousand queries a day. And the reason for that was in, in lots of search systems, a lot of the logging happened client side. I mean, even things like Microsoft Help for, for Windows or Office was done, it was only logged client side. And so there was no way for a system to improve by seeing what people were doing, what they were successful at and so on. Now, fast forward to today, and there are, um, you know, search has really transformed in amazing ways. It, it's, there are billions of websites, trillions of web pages indexed by search engines, billions of clicks every day. And, you know, in many ways, search has been transformed from this arcane skill that librarians and geeks were uh, really skillful at to a core fabric of everybody's life on a daily basis. I mean, we all use it to, find information, to buy things, uh, plan travel, understand medical conditions, monitor events. Um, and it's, you know, it's really pervasive. It's not just for web search. It happens on the enterprise desktop and in apps. One place where search hasn't permeated, and I think it's a matter of time before, only a matter of time before it will, is into the real world. So right now you cannot type control F as you're in a grocery store or in a physical uh, place, but I, I think uh, you know with with smart objects we we will see more of that, and so um, you know for the the younger students in the audience, it's you may find it hard to imagine a world in which you don't have information at your fingertips uh, twenty four by seven, and you can speak that uh, those queries, uh, and it, it's just a very very different environment, and because of the importance of search as a really core fabric of what we do every single day. I think it's more important than ever to understand and, and support searchers. And so that's what the rest of this talk will, will be about. So um, understanding a short query is uh, exceedingly difficult if you consider that query in isolation. So I've typed into this search box, the query SIGIR. It occurs in about 2 million web pages. And it's really hard to know what that, that might mean. Now, luckily for us, queries don't fall from the sky. Uh, they're issued by real people who are seeking to solve an information need. And so our task of interpreting and understanding this query is much easier if we know something about who is asking the question, what they've done 
in the uh, in the immediate past, perhaps some of the, their longer term preferences, where they are, when it is, and, and so on. Um, and so these these kinds of contexts play a really important role in uh, in search in modern search engines. So here's an example of, of context. So if I ask the query SIGIR, I'm, folks here know me as an informational retrieval researcher. What I probably want to do is to go to the SIGIR uh, conference webpage or maybe the SIGIR.org webpage. There's this other guy um, who's named Stuart Bowen Jr. He, he is currently um, has some role in, in Texas government, but at the time, uh, at the time that I, I took this screenshot, he was the um, he was the special inspector general for Iraq reconstruction, also abbreviated SIGIR. So two people have a very very different interpretation of that that query. And so in this case, you could interpret the query by knowing something about who we are. You might also uh, look at a more short term perspective. If, if all you knew was the previous query and the query SIGIR was preceded by information retrieval versus US coalitional provisional authority, you might have some sense of what the person uh, meant by that query. You might know by location, you know, if the query is issued at a SIGIR conference versus in Washington, DC, you might derive some signals from when it's asked, even for the information retrieval intent. You know, in January, which is coming up soon, people are looking for information about submission deadlines. And in August, when the conference typically happens, they're looking for uh, information about schedules and, and so on. Um, and so if you take away nothing else from this talk, what I want to emphasize is that I think it's critical to when we develop information systems to um, to do the best we can in answering people's information needs and that using a single ranking for everyone in every context at every point in time is gonna fundamentally limit how well we can do as a search engine. We can clearly work on core ranking algorithms. They are far from ideal, but in addition, there's, um, there's a lot of improvement that can happen by better understanding uh, context and personalization is a critical part of that. So uh, I just said that. Uh, what we wanted to do was quantify the variation in relevance for the same query across different individuals. So given SIGIR, how many likely different intents are there? And this curve um, plots on the x-axis the number of people whose needs you're trying to satisfy, only six here, but imagine it being uh, you know six, 6 billion. And on the y-axis, some measure of search quality. In this case, it's um, NDCG. And so if you have the world's perfect search engine that answers everybody's question right 100% of the time, you'll be at the top blue line doing an amazing job. If you have to rely on a single ranking for everyone, the more people who you're trying to satisfy, the lower your accuracy will be. And uh, this gap between what you can do with a perfect personalized engine and what you can do using a single system for every person is what we call the potential for personalization. Um, now, there are lots of ways that you can measure what's relevant to an individual. You could have explicit judgments in the same way that we often do with IR test collections. Um, what's important, though, is to col collect those judgments, not just from uh, one individual, but from many different individuals. You can also use implicit judgments, so to speak. Um, using things like click entropy or content analysis. And you'll see during the rest of the talk that we use um, almost all of these, uh, these different techniques. And personalization can lead to really large improvements in systems. I just, uh, I hope my cursor is showing up. I just showed here the gap between what you can do with a single ranking versus personalized rankings. And this gap is the, um, you know, how much you can add by personalization. There's still a gap in, uh, in this particular study we did between the current state of web search and what you could do with, um, uh, you know, by improving core ranking. And so with, you know, just improving core ranking, you can improve things by about 45% and that jumps to 70% when you add um, this, this personalization component. So huge advantages to uh, to be had. There are clearly some in core ranking, which lots of folks at, at CIIR have studied over many decades. 
Okay, not all queries have a high potential uh, for personalization. So if you take a query like the New York, New York Times, almost everybody who issues that query, greater than 95% of them click on nytimes.com. And so there's a dominant intent. Um, that's one where there's not a lot of opportunity to, to personalize. Uh, in contrast, I've drawn a graph here of uh, how many different intents there might be for a query that begins with, uh, that ends with maps. And so if you look at Bing Maps or Google Maps, so the top two curves here, there's not much, uh, there's a pretty dominant intent there. No matter how many people you ask, what, who, whose uh, information need you try to identify, you really wind up with um, a very flat uh, potential for personalization curve. For things like area code map, this curve here, or European map, this one here, there is much greater variability in, in what people want. And it's a mixture of you know, different intents, but also different preferences about the kinds of maps they want to see, what they might be looking at in, in a map. And so um, one of the things that, that you can do is learn for any query when you might, um, when you should try to, when you should personalize that query. In many ways, you can think about a lot of this work on personalization as smoothing between using a global model um, and then adding to it personalized information when you have it and are confident about it. So not every query has high potential, but those that do can benefit a lot from personalization. Um, I thought it would be fun to look at the query CIIR. So that has uh, 761,000 web pages. And what's the potential for personalization for this? Almost everybody at this talk will think about this meaning, the Center for Intelligent Information Retrieval. Um, but it's also a, a, the abbreviation for a synthetic rubber company, so you, comp, uh, uh, synthetic rubber. So you see a lot of um, polymer research organizations talking about CIIR, IIR, SIIR, whatever. Um, it is also the name of the, the, the abbreviation for Center of in, Intercultural and Indigenous Research in Chile. It's the... Um, an abbreviation for the, it's not an abbreviation for the Chinese University of Labor Relations. It is an abbreviation for the China Institute of Industrial Relations, which was its former name. Um, it's also an abbreviation for the Center for, uh, in, I think it's uh, Immunology, Inflammation and Regenerative Medicine. And so you get the idea. There are lots of different intents, every one of them a perfectly reasonable intent. And the question is, how can we try to understand um, what people mean by the same query? So now, even if, if somebody were more explicit and typed in CIIR, UMass, information retrieval, this is the intent they're looking for. It's the object of what they're looking for is, uh, is pretty clear. Again, there are many different subtleties. So maybe you're looking to see who the faculty are. Maybe you want to find the faculty. Maybe you want to find the CII talks series. You know, maybe you want to go to the GitHub repo. Maybe you want, this is one of my favorites. I actually still use uh, <laughs> this site to find um, older CIAR publications. So even when the in intent is, is clear in the sense of maybe linguistic um, uncertainty, what aspect of that you might want to, uh, to understand is still something that's, um, that's not always clear. And you can think of this really as a, the distinction between an extrinsic diversity, sort of the notion of ambiguity um, versus intrinsic diversity or different aspects of what someone might want to know about CIIR. And I think we need to accommodate both of those. And how, you know, how might you identify these different intents? I'm going to talk about two classes of uh, features that we look at. One is past behaviors. So that, you know, the current session someone is in as well as a longer term history of actions and, and preferences. And there's also a lot of contextual metadata that, that um, you know, that, that one can use. And so let, uh, right. So I'm going to do one more thing um, outlining the, the projects I'm going to talk about and then take a, a short break for, for questions. So when you think about building a, a model of a person's interests, many sources of evidence, right? You can use um, content behavior. And as I just talked about uh, contextual metadata, the time horizon on which you build this model can either be very short term, it could be the immediately preceding query, or it could be a much longer term um, profile of a, a person's interests and preferences. 
it can be an individual. And you know, when you hear the word personalization, you think about, I'm gonna personalize it to an individual. But there are also many affinity groups that we all belong to. And one can certainly uh, personalize or groupize, if you will, to a set of people who, who share some common interest or location or a variety of other things. Um, and then there are all sorts of things about the models themselves, you know, where they reside, how they're used, and then whether when they're used. And so what I'm gonna do today is talk about four examples that kind of span this space of how models are constructed and how they're used. The first is some, some very old work that Jamie Tevan led on personal navigation. This work um, uses just the model of a person's interest is just the queries and web pages they visited over a period of time. It's at an individual level. The model lives on the server. It's used for ranking and it's applied sometimes when you have relevant history. Another example is something that uh, I worked on called personalized search. Here you see a much richer model of a person's interest constantly evolving. Again, it's at an individual level. Here the model resides on the server and we used it for both ranking and, and presentation. I've done uh, work with Paul Bennett and, and Ryan White on a very badly named uh, system called short and long-term models. Uh, but this looks at models on, on different time horizons. It looks at both individuals and groups and um, it also is server side. And then finally, there are a variety of spatio-temporal things that we've looked at both temporal context and spatial context. And you can see again, they, they are situated in, in this design space. So I'm gonna give you a, a quick overview of each of these efforts just to talk about some of the challenges in, in designing and evaluating systems uh, when and where they sit in, in this space of, of opportunities. So I wanna take a quick break to see if there are any questions about this, this general framing. Thanks, Sue. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, you know, we read them. Um, Grant is asking if the dominant mode for specifying the search query shifts from typed keyword to recognize the speech, does that make the personalization problem easier harder or just different? Um, I don't think it makes the personalization problem any different. Uh, you do see a variety of very ling different linguistic expressions when people are talking. They talk in much more of a conversational manner. It's much easier to stitch together queries that um, are, the, you know, I might ask, um, you know, where is CIR located? Uh, who is the technical lead of it, right? So you see a lot more pronominal reference and, and just very explicit notions of uh, a different kind of context when the queries are, are spoken. I don't think it changes the algorithms very much at all. It, and it may change the, it, it will certainly change the intent, right? So given that I'm on the go on a phone or whatever other my device might be, it probably does change the, the intent, but not the underlying models or methods of evaluation. Okay, thanks. And Mohamed is asking on when to personalize, how much do you think fair and unbiased ranking plays a role versus global performance? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I will get back to, uh, I will talk about when to, to personalize later and so maybe we can revisit that that question um sure so i will ask muhammad to uh like clarify what the question is and okay. we said this later in the next one yeah i mean in, you know in all of these estimates you're, you're going to get a, an estimate of a person's interest based on what's shown to them and that's a uh first that's a kind of bias you you can only in you can only engage with information that's shown there are lots of other signals like um, people reformulating queries, people switching to different search engines. And so you have some signals of when search is, is problematic, but it's, uh, you know, we're, we don't do, and you can do randomization of, of various kinds, um, but it's, yeah, and so there are, I, I'm not 100% sure what the, the notion of, you know, fairness and, and bias um, is that, that's being talked about. Okay, thanks. Okay, so yeah, let me uh, go on and talk very briefly about each of these um, examples. Uh, 
I have a couple slides on, on each. So when, you know, when we think of search, we usually think about it as a, a way to discover new information, but it's also very commonly used, especially in the web to refine information. So I wanna do a little audience participation and I'll let the, the results percolate in as I talk through the rest of this slide. Think back on the last query, web search query you did, and in the chat window, write whether, uh, write yes if it was, uh, write new if it was a query you had never issued before, write old if it was a query you had issued before. And we just get a sense of how often people are repeating their search queries. So in, in, if you look at this over, um, you know, huge web collection, you know, billions of queries, we see that, uh, that repeat queries occur about 33% of the time. And furthermore, when the queries repeat, you also see a large number of repeat clicks on the same URLs. Many of these repeat queries and clicks are characteristic of, of what Andre Broder and others called navigational queries. So these typically have, uh, these are queries for which somebody wants to get to a site typically rather than find out about. It's very, very easy to identify these consistent navigational queries across individuals. Um, they are easy to identify by low click entropy as well as shared anchor text. So if you look at the anchor text of the New York Times homepage, the phrase New York Times is there in a very, very large proportion of them. Um, now, the, the interesting insight in, in this work is that there might be multiple interests. Um, there might not be a single uniform interest across all users, but within a user or within a person, that person may have a consistent intent over time. So these are called what Jamie Tevan and, and others call personal navigation queries. So there are different intents across individuals, but within an individual, the intent is consistent. So an example of that would be SIGIR for me versus uh, Stuart Bowen, right? And the question is how prevalent these are, how easy they are to identify and, and how important they are. So the, this work involved a large scale log analysis sort of offline um, using methods to identify personal navigation queries. There was a, a simple heuristic at that time. It's a, a much richer algorithm now. Uh, the, the heuristic was if uh, looking at the consistency of queries and clicks within an individual. So if a person issues a query, clicks on one and only one result, they issue that query again, and click on one and only one result, the likelihood that they do it if they issue the query, click on the same result if they issue the query the third time is something like you know, 95%. And so the algorithm was simply to uh, you know, record that, that information. The interesting thing is that there are many such queries. So about 12% of query volume are these personal navigation queries where there's a consistent intent within an individual, um, but not across individuals. And prediction accuracy is really high. So this is a case where you have really high coverage and low risk. And it was, uh, it was the first kind of personalization that, that Bing used. And it was evaluated, of course, in, um, in randomized controlled trials on, online in these so-called AB evaluation or, or uh, bandit style uh, experiments. And it really confirmed the, the offline log analysis. So people saw, um, and the treatment here was that you would click the item that, or move the item that you thought was the, uh, target URL for the personal navigation intent to the top of the list. And the benefits were um, really large. It also really led Bing into uh, considering many other kinds of personalization once uh, this, this worked uh, really well and, um, and it really helped people find what they were looking for more quickly. So I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about the personalized search, uh, P-Search system that, that I built. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the previous example used a very, very simple model of a person's interest. Uh, P-Search uses a much richer model. It used the full content of your uh, desktop search index, your interaction history. Uh, this is rich and constantly evolving. The, this involved client-side re-ranking of web search results. So in, in this case, um, you know, a person issued a query, so type CIIR, it goes off to Bing, comes back to your local machine. Uh, each of those results is matched to your local profile. And if there's a good match, we note that and then um, re-rank, okay? 
Now for this system to work, we had to return many more results than the top 10. I think we returned 50 or 100. Uh, and so, but uh, it, every, all, all of the uh, personalization happens on the client. It's a really good privacy because you only send the query to the server, uh, but it has limited portability, right? If you move from one device to another, you don't have that model there. You lose the ability to leverage the, the trails that people who are like you blaze um, in the web. And so, you know, again, there are advantages and, and disadvantages to, to this, this model. And I'll just describe sort of how we, what the model is like in more detail and then how we were evaluated. So uh, this is uh, this model consisted of a personalized re-ranking on the client, as I just said, and the score that we used to rank items was just a weighted linear combination of the web, web score and then a personalized score. And the personalized score, again, was a fairly simple model. It was essentially the log odds of the, the query terms appearing in your model or in your personal repository versus in web content. So if it's very likely to occur in your personal uh, repository, even if it's low frequency in the web, it's an important term. Uh, and we also looked at interaction history, visits to specific URLs, as well as a back off to the site. And we, we tested this by building a prototype and, and deploying it. We had, uh, uh, I guess, a few hundred people at Microsoft use it for several months. And you can actually see one of the, the treatments here. What we did was um, in one condition, we put the personalized results kind of in a bifurcated list or uh, uh, above the regular web results. In another condition, we just blended them with the web, uh, web results. We found overall uh, almost 30% higher click-through rate for personalized results. But what's even more interesting is that we found 75% higher uh, click-through rate when the evidence was very strong, when we had many um, examples of your personal interaction history or content that were consistent with the, the query. And that's when we started building models to learn when to, to personalize. And as I said before, you can start thinking you can think about this as, as smoothing from a global model as a, the baseline. And then um, you know, to the extent that you have very, co you're confident in uh, personal evidence, you can start re-weighting re in, in different ways. So it's really just a smoothing between a globally applicable model, a less broadly applicable model that you have higher um, confidence in. Okay, let me shop, talk about the, the short and, and long-term uh, preferences work. Th this again, um, this is interesting because the, the previous two examples looked at long-term profiles. But you know, as we all know, what, what you're looking for can depend not just on your long-term interest, but also a very acute need uh, that's determined by the, the task at, at hand. And so this uh, work explicitly modeled both long-term preferences in uh, an interest as well as short-term task context. And this is important because it, in, at least in the context of the web, 60% uh, of search sessions have multiple queries. So you at least have some context about what the person uh, might be interested in. And so, what, you know, again, what we modeled here was a very simple model. It was the um, given a query, what the previous queries and clicks were. And I think we also had a, um, an ODP style topical representation. So this is you know, a, the query CIR given information versus Iraq reconstruction or CIIR given information retrieval versus butyl rubber, which is apparently an important part of CIIR, the polymer. Um, Query like ego given id has a very, as a preceding query, has a very different interpretation than ego given the El Dorado Gold Corporation. EGO is its a uh, stock symbol. Um, or then the previous query being dangerously in love. So if somebody has an idea about how ego and dangerously in, lo in love are related, they can type it in the chat and you'll all learn a little something about popular culture. Um, okay, and so the, the personalized ranking that we looked at um, combines both of these perspectives, a, a long-term view as well as a, a acute information uh, needs and, and tasks. And so what we did was we had a model that had both um, the current session as well as historical data and then various uh, temporal weightings of those two signals. 
we did a, a large scale log analysis um, and found that these the short term session history um, was had a boost of about 25% versus not incorporating any of that information. Historic long term history, of course, is a, a little better an estimate of what somebody's uh, interests are, and that has a bigger boost. And by combining them in different ways, you can get a much larger gain in this case in, in mean average precision. So each has an in, important contribution in isolation and together they're, they're really strong. It's also fun to look at what happens within a, a session. So if you look at, again, this is the, the map gain um, for these different models, historic um, and various aggregates. The first query in a session, you have to use historical data. You can see the importance of the, um, the session information on the second and uh, subsequent queries. But by the third query, the, the session level information is already dominating the longer term preference information. And so with a really very short context, you can do some, some really interesting and accurate kinds of, of personalization. Now, when, whenever you do personalization, uh, and combine long and short term interests is a very interesting phenomenon about what happens if the current session is not relevant to, you know, is different than your acute needs are different than your long term interests. So here's an example user model that has high level uh, topic categories as well as specific search queries. And you look at this and uh, the percent indicates how often what proportion of their queries have to do with football or boxing or television travel hockey this is a, a sports sports person <laughs> and probably from the philadelphia area or at least the northeast so given a new query it probably makes sense if they're asking about uh, a, a boxing match to use that history on the other hand a new session might look like the, the following right root canal, dental implant, dental implant recovery. This is not a typical interest for this person, um, but it is an important need to, to satisfy. And one of the interesting question things is that about 6% of sessions that we find in web search are atypical. And they uh, the common topics are things like medical concerns like this one, um, computer and other kinds of troubleshooting. These kinds of, of sessions tend to be more complex, have poorer quality results. And in many ways, there are things that you need to do versus things that, that you choose, choose to do. And so uh, what we did was try to combine, to learn a model to identify atypical sessions and apply different personalization models for uh, these, these two cases. And so again, I'm showing change in precision by typicality of, of session. If you use just the session profile, you do okay for um, atypical queries, you do very well for typical queries. Conversely, if you look at just historical data, you do very well for common typical queries, really horrible for atypical queries. And if you combine them both, you, you do uh, very well. So again, it's uh, uh, by understanding a, a little bit more subtlety about when to apply these models, we can do a, a much better job of satisfying information needs in a, a robust way. Um, ooh, I am, uh, I'm going to skip, uh, I'm going to do temporal dynamics and then and skip spatial dynamics and then go on to some of the other questions. So one of the interesting things in, in web search is that queries are not uniformly distributed over time. They're often triggered by events in the world. So here's a, a, a daily query, a, a daily frequency histogram for the query pizza. It has a weekly periodicity. Uh, Saturday night is big pizza night. If you look at deep learning, that query has gone up sort of steadily over time. Uh, there are others like US Open that has, if you look at this, two very consistent peaks throughout the, the year. Um, they actually refer to, uh, I'll get to this in a minute. So you know, what's relevant to the query US Open in 2020 is different than in 2019. Um, US Open issued in May often refers to the golf event. When it's issued in September, it typically refers to the tennis event. And then even if you know that it's a US Tennis Open in 2020, what's relevant to that query varies as a function of where you are in that acute event. So before the event, people want schedule information and tickets. During the event, they want real-time scores. 
Um, and then after the event, they want uh, general information like Wikipedia and, and US Tennis Association. So we developed, uh, some of this was with Don Metzler. Um, let me just say at a high level what we did. We developed time aware retrieval models. So we, we looked um, uh, with, uh, actually this was John Elsis, uh, not Don Metzler. Um, we looked at the, the rate of change of words on a page over time. And so that, that allows, and that allows you to estimate um, the longevity of words on a, a particular page that is very predictive of their characterization of, of that page. So words that have long standing power on a page reflect what the page is typically about and then transient words of, of reflect what the uh, current topics of, of the day are. And we got some pretty nice benefits over um, uh, a language model baseline. We also looked at user interactions over time as a time series to try to understand some of these periodicities and use that to model what would be relevant at, at different points in time. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to, to talk about this, but there's also clearly location contexts that, that matter. Um, so let me just skip it, but uh, you can interpret, this figure just shows the, the density of clicks on the two different URLs for the query uh, SMH. So when people is from Florida issue that query, they click on the Sarasota Memorial Hospital. When people in big metropolitan areas click, issue that query, they click on the Sydney, Sydney Morning Herald. And so again, you can see that um, there are topics and queries that have much more of a location sensitivity. And it's, it's fairly easy to, to model these and to, to use it to improve um, retrieval. I'm gonna skip that. Any questions on these examples? I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the uh, challenges as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, I don't see any question about these examples yet, but there are some questions um, from the past session. So it's, um, Jamie is asking if, do you think that there is a still uh, some way of doing personalization for cold start setting when we don't have a lot of information about the user's past interactions or behavioral information? Yeah, I mean, you, you can use, um, you, you can use many things, right? So if, if you, uh, you can back off to the web model. <laughs> you can also use maybe uh, contextual metadata. So where the person is, is located, um, you can, so that's the, the kind of groupization notion. Um, but you know, the, the worst case in, in the context of the web is you're starting with the global model, right? And, and that's not a horrible position to start in. So it's, I think it's not, uh, and I guess in, in recommend, recommender systems, it would be starting like with uh, sort of the normative models that, that you know were highly rated. And you can clearly explore a little bit more when you don't know what somebody wants to, to learn. Okay, thanks. And Jeremy is asking one of the problems he has is that these uh, personalizations are happening implicitly and he doesn't have any like explicit control over them. And it has uh, many problems, for example, when uh, he searched for something in another location and it's keep showing the results for its current location and so on. So. Yeah, yeah there, there's a, they're clearly, um, you know, I think one thing that, that web search engines do is at least provide some transparency about what, um, what they're saving, what, you know, what, what is being used in, in, the, um, in the modeling in terms of your previous interaction and, and behavioral uh, information. You can either use that or, or not, but you clearly do not have very uh, uh, fine-grained control. And, and maybe that is something that one would want to provide more and more of for advanced users. Um, I mean, right now you can you know, search in incognito mode. You can uh, get rid of your history. Um, but you know, the, the history is, is, again, not used just for personalization of ranking, but for autocomplete and a variety of things like that. So we could have much more granular uh, control and uh, that, you know, it is a, a, a good question. It's not clear how much it would get used, but uh, I think that, you know, the initial steps in that direction are to at least provide transparency 
uh, typically about queries and URLs and, and allow people to edit or, or delete those, those histories. Okay. And, and frankly, the web search algorithms are these, uh, it, it, it's often hard to understand why they match things in, in the way they do. They're very uh, complex multi-stage models that are, that are uh, learned models right now. Much harder to debug. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so let me just go to some of the challenges and, and opportunities. There are a ton of opportunities. Some of them are, are user-centered and some are systems oriented. I mean, just one for systems folks in, in the audience that I'll just mention is, you know, web search engines are, are super fast because partly because of optimization. So they cache things, uh, you know, issue the query New York Times, by and large, you're, you're getting a cached version of that. The minute you start doing personalization, you bust the cache, <laughs> it, you totally bust the cache. And so, you know, one of the things that, that was done is to cache, um, a larger set of, of results and then do re-ranking on, on the fly. And so that there are you know, huge downstream implications of, of doing these, these things. Um, let me say something about privacy uh, because I think it's it, you know, really important. Fundamentally, if you're gonna do personalization, the profile and the content need to be in the same location. So they can both be on the client or they can both be on the, the server. Otherwise you just in, incur all sorts of delays and. Uh, and communication overhead and leakage of, of information. So you know that if if you have a local profile like personalized search, you it's very private. Only the query is sent to the server, uh, but it's also very device specific. It's inefficient because you have to send a lot more results to be able to have some fodder for re-ranking locally. Um, and there's no ability to learn from from others who are like you, both in the short term as as well as the long term. If it's a cloud profile, like this is related to Jeremy's question, I think, um, and that's where most personalization happens these, these days, but with smarter edge devices, I think we'll, we'll see it shifting a, a little bit moving forward. Uh, you need transparency and, and control over uh, what's stored. The, the harder link is uh, the relationship between explicit uh, interactions in the past and, and the ranking. Those are much more complex than they were in some of the early systems. Um, and then a bunch of other approaches, right? So there's public and semi-public profiles. There's you know tweets that people have issued, blog posts, papers they've written. Um, that all, all of this helps in terms of uh, you know bootstrapping. There are lightweight profiles. We talked about queries in a session. There's ways to aggregate to related cohorts. So all of these help in in both the um, you know the cold start problem as as well as in um, in being able to, to do something even, uh, yes, they help a lot with the cold start problem and um, uh, yeah. Okay, um, you know, people often talk about personalization meaning the end of, of serendipity. And uh, you know, it, it turns out that we did a, a study on both novelty, uh, on interestingness and, and relevance. And so um, we found that, that uh, personalization can actually improve serendipity if by that what you mean is something that's interesting but not relevant. And so we did an experiment again on relevance versus interestingness. Not surprisingly, personalization finds more relevant results, but it also finds more interesting results even when the results are not relevant. And you know, I think the reason for this is that when people talk um, about serendipity, they don't mean random. You know, you don't want to see random event, random items, in part because you can't make sense of, of them. What you need to do is, uh, you know, in, in cognitive science and in learning, people talk about the zone of proximal learning. It's things that are on the fringes of your awareness that you can incorporate in, in interesting ways. And I think that's a, a lot of the notion of of serendipity that, that people talk about. So like the princes of uh, Serendip who tried to make uh, sense of the, the many clues that they were getting about um, uh, you know, uh, they, we, you know, they, 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 of the, the camel who was, uh, you know, a, a camel that had a, 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 a lame a leg. Uh, they discovered this by both uh, sagacity and accident. And so, you need to be ready for, for new information. 
Um, do I have time? Yeah, this is a group that loves evaluation. Let me just talk about this uh, quickly. So how do you evaluate personal results? I alluded to this a, a little bit before. Uh, you can use external judges, you know, the assessors in, in Trek speak, but they lack uh, the diversity of intense and realistic contents that, that people have. One of the things that you see the first time you deploy any system in the wild is just the amazing diversity of people um, and their interests and, and extent and, and intents. And that's just hard to, uh, to simulate. We've actually done some work where we try to simulate this by crowdsourcing, having people try to understand uh, different individuals. Um, you can actually have the actual, you know, the searchers themselves are the judges. I think that's really the only answer to this. It's just a, a complex one. You know, you can do it um, offline by by asking people to explicitly make relevance judgments. It is annoying, um, it's disruptive, but it is a very good way to capture kind of in situ what a person means by what they're, um, they're looking at. And, um, and so you, know, you can do these both offline and, and online. And uh, as I said just now, the, the explicit judgments are nice, uh, but annoying. The implicit judgments are scalable, but uh, really noisy and, and unlabeled. And so uh, we've done some work on trying to link all of these implicit actions and indicators of a person's interests with explicit judgments and been built models to, to do that uh, quite explicitly. And that does help uh, you know, a fair amount in, in um, using the very plentiful but very noisy implicit behavioral signals. So let me just end and then have time, I think, for um, a few more questions. Uh, you know, what I hope to, to convey today is that if you look at, at search queries in isolation, they're exceedingly difficult uh, to interpret, but this can be very much improved by understanding a little bit about the context in which they occur, things like who's asking, when it is, what they've done in the past, where, it, you know, where they are, and, and things like that. Um, there's large potential for personalization in improving uh, search via personalization. There's also large potential for improving search through enhancements in, in core ranking. And we need to work on, on both of those simultaneously. I gave you examples of some of the work that, that we've done over the last uh, decade or so in, in this. Uh, there are very different challenges in different kinds of, of models and, and settings. And then there are you know, a number of, of challenges with regard to privacy, transparency, um, and evaluation and, and system optimization. So I think there's tremendous opportunity. Um, and right now, more and more systems are being personalized and contextualized. And I think this is especially true in both mobile and proactive scenarios. So I think you know, we as uh, researchers in, in the area need to understand the right underlying technology, but also the right, uh, you know, best practices to make this happen. And I think, you know, folks like those at, at CIIR and the, the Center for Data Science uh, here are exactly the right people uh, to take the, the lead in shaping, you know, best practices and, and policies in a, a user-centered way. So thanks. Um, and here's a list of my many collaborators in, in these efforts. Thanks, Susan. Thanks. It was a really great talk and thought provoking. Um, I really appreciate it. There are still some questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna. I, I, I'm not sure if we have time to answer all of them, but let's see. So Marco is asking um, your opinion on differences and similarities between personalization in web search and personal search, such as email, shared yeah. photos, and something like that. Um, I actually think they're pretty different. Uh, in, so wait, let, let me back up. I think they are similar in the um, extent, in the, in, the, in the sense that in both cases, what you want to do is try to understand what a, a person is, is looking for. And that could be uh, dictated by sort of previous behavioral you know, interactions. It could be dictated by current, uh, you know, acute information needs and, and so on. But personal search, so to search over your own email um, and other content, 
is very, very distinct uh, from web search in, in many ways. So let me just mention two. The first is that you know an awful lot more about uh, what you're looking for in email search. If you look at, if ask people to uh, you know, articulate the last web query they did, they'll give you some high level thing like I was looking for the SIGIR homepage. Um, if you ask them to the last email search they did, they will say things like, I, I, I remember the last one I did with Hamid. It was an email about where all the links for this talk were contained. It contained, came yesterday. He sent it to Emily, my executive assistant. Um, I, I know it was on in a long thread. So there's so much metadata that you know. I think as designers of retrieval systems in over personal content, we need to make it easy for people to articulate um, those additional aspects that, that they know about. Um, it can be done in the interface, it can be done through ranking algorithms. So I think they're very, very different in what people know. Um, and interestingly, I, you know, I talked about refinding. Um, in the web, when people go to issue the same query over time, they more often than not click on the same result in email search, exactly the opposite is true. If I issue the query from Eric, who, who used to be my, uh, my manager for 20 some years, and I issue that on two separate days, I'm very unlikely to click on the same mail. It's for me a shorthand for the last thing from Eric, right? <laughs> and so in the web, you see a query, um, a repeat query often leading to this, a click on the same item across sessions. In an email, you see you don't see that. It, in um, within a session in web search, the same query often leads to clicks on the different URLs. And in email, it's exactly the opposite. The same query within a session, you want to get back to the item you had just found because there's no easy way. There's no tabs and, and things like that in email search. So the there are very consistent patterns in the two, but they're opposite patterns. <laughs> Uh, Christopher is asking that he found this sensitivity study interesting. Can you mention what is the paper? Oh yeah, there um, there are two papers in that that area, both with a, a person named Paul Andre, who is listed uh, kind of in the middle of, of this list, and at least one appeared in Creativity and Cognition. <laughs> so you and the other appeared at I think in Kai. So if you look for me and Paul Andre, you'll you'll find those. I think we called it something like, you know, serendipity is not by chance or something. Okay, thanks. Uh, Petra is asking, I'm curious if more personalization can lead to filter bubbles. What are the ways to avoid this? Yeah, um, there are many uh, things to, to say about this. Uh, I, you know, I think the let, let's just start, start at a, a, a pragmatic level, at, at least in the context of web search, a lot of personalization is done as re-ranking. So um, you are likely to have a very diverse set of content to start from anyway. Uh, and uh, I think uh, yeah, you, you have a much more diverse set of, of information to start from. Lots of search engines these days present results that blend many different notions of what would be relevant. So that it's topical relevance, it's recency, it's a variety. There's a lot of exploration that, that goes on in, in web search. I mean, even think about things like collapsing the, the results for a particular site. That's a way to increase the diversity of, of results. And so, you know, I, I think um, the fact that there are those multiple objectives going on makes it, quite hard to get stuck in a, a filter bubble. I think web search is also different than more proactive grazing, browsing behavior that you see in, in social media outlets or uh, you know, even news sites. If I'm searching for CIIR, I'm telling you what I want. And I, you know, this, I don't know what the notion of filter bubble would be there. So I think there, you know, there are different intents. Pragmatically, there's, um, already a fair amount of diversity that happens even in personalized systems. And I, I do think it's a little different than, uh, you know, just browsing. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, there are still a lot of questions. Uh, I want to apologize to people who ask questions. I, I don't have time to ask them to Susan. Uh, but thanks a lot of people are thanking you for this informative talk and thanks for accepting our invitation. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to meet with several people this afternoon. So happy to follow up there. Um, or you know, if, uh, if Hamid shares uh, the the queries with me, I, I can uh, help uh, answer some of them offline. Sure, sure. Great, thank you. Yes, thanks. thanks. And a beautiful clap. And okay.